Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. I'm going to start by taking you back to October last year when Hurricane Sandy was threatening the east coast of the US. Now, I am a social scientist who researches crisis data and social media, so I was really interested to see what was going to happen with this particular event. And as it was, I got to see it up close and personal because I was living in New York City at the time in Zone A, otherwise known as the Compulsory Evacuation Zone. So while the water was flooding down my street and the power went out in my building, I could rest comfortably in the knowledge that my collaborators, both at Microsoft Research and at a range of different universities, were quietly and consistently gathering all of the data that was emerging around this time so that we could use it to reflect on what was occurring during this particular disaster event. And I think there's an enormous amount of potential uh, bringing together crisis informatics with machine learning, with information retrieval, with social science, to reflect on how we can use data better in disasters. But there are limits as well. So we could take the Hurricane Sandy Twitter set as an example here. There are around 20 million tweets, which is a substantial data set for anyone, really. But if you look at where the majority of those tweets come from, they almost all center in Manhattan. So if we only analyze those tweets, we're missing out on the far more seriously affected areas, places like Breezy Point, the Rockaways, Coney Island. So the Twitter data, in a way, is skewed towards a very urban, privileged experience of that disaster. And this is just one of many examples in terms of how these data sets can both tell us an enormous amount of information, but they also have gaps and they have biases. So working with my colleagues Fernando Diaz at Microsoft Research in New York City and Megan Finn at Microsoft Research in New England, we wanted to bring together some of the key researchers in this field to share with you some of the stories that we think are really interesting that can be done with crisis data, but also some of the limitations and challenges that we're facing and how we might try to overcome them by working together across different disciplines. So we're trying to think about these concepts of data and disaster very broadly. So when we're talking about data, we're really talking about a whole range of different kinds of data challenges. And here, Eitan Nadar from the University of Michigan has an enormous amount to teach us. We're also thinking about disasters from the angle of natural disasters, which we heard this morning from Tony Hay's excellent introduction. But we're also thinking about particular kinds of social disasters. And here I'm thinking about the Mexican drug war and the work that's being done by Andres Monroy Hernandez, who's based here at Microsoft Research in Redmond. And then finally, I'm extremely excited to present to you Leisha Palin, who is one of the leading researchers in this space. She's based at the University of Colorado Boulder, where she's an associate professor in computer science. But she's also the director of Project EPIC, which is one of the leading projects in thinking how the public can use information better during a crisis event. So what we'll be doing today is hearing from each one of these fantastic speakers, and then we'll move to a brief Q&A so you can ask them questions that hopefully will help you reflect on your work as well. So to begin, I would like to introduce Leisha Palin. Please welcome her. Good morning. Um, so I'll be talking about um, crisis informatics. Can we turn this down just a little bit? Is that better for everybody? Maybe I'll move it down. Does it seem a little loud? Security all over again. Security checks. Airport. Yeah. <laughs> That's all you can do? Let's take this off. Sorry, folks. Just a sec. Let's see if. There we go. Does that help? All right. I'll just hold it then. Okay. Just give me one more second to set up this. 
This is the kind of intro I wanted to have, by the way. A really powerful start. OK. Um, all right, so I'm going to give a very broad overview of some things that we've learned about in this area that we've come to call crisis informatics, um, an area that considers both the current uses of social media, social computing, and the future uses of such technology in emergency management. So in the time I have, um, all I'm really attempting to do is to try to compel the area and situate the research conceptually, right, um, with highlights about what some of those broad issues are. So I'd like to first begin by framing this as a problem of, okay, a technical problem, okay. Okay, is that good? Great. Okay. So I'd like to first frame this as disaster as an environment of mass convergence of resources, of people, and of information. Um, I think that's often contrary to um, how we normally think about disasters, just as, as our, an off the cuff kind of definition of them. We think about people leaving and evacuating and get, you know, getting away from the scene of the incident. Um, Let's see here. Boy, I wish I could just start over again. But don't worry. I just hope I have a few more minutes, Kate, because of this. OK. All right. So um, uh, but, but even when we have times where people are leaving a situation, uh, they are, they're diverging from the scene of the incident, but they're converging somewhere else, right? They're converging onto shelters in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in the area surrounding the event. But even then, that kind of divergence activity is for a very small amount of time, and otherwise we have people converging onto the scene, including the first responders that we've come to know and expect will come to our aid, uh, but also the victims who are well enough to do something, their friends and family, and then other people who are known as the spontaneous convergers, the unpaid professionals who are interested in helping um, those who are on the ground and those who are interested in finding out what's going on and, may, and then maybe turn to help. So these are existing phenomena that now have digital analogs in the, in the online sphere. People create online sites in response to disasters that they face or might face. They congregate in, on, on those online sites. They search for information. They then produce information. And then we get people who are self-organized in social networks um, because of those pursuits of information and the provision of information. So this idea of mass convergence online is both of interest to study behaviorally um, and to support socio-technically in terms of new innovation. Um, and of course, it's the yield of that convergence, all that digital data, that is also of interest to us as computer and information scientists. The second way I'd like you to think about the role of computing in, and, uh, in emergency management is that we need to build not just for the formal responders. And up until just about three years ago, this was a really major point. I think it continues to be. When we think about technology, I think we first, and emergency response, we think about those who are on the ground who need good tools and aids. And we think about those in emergency operations centers. And of course, we want to continue to provide good tools and services for those people. But we also need to care about the informal response, too. Why do we care about the informal response? Well, participation by members of the public in disaster and mass emergency, it's always been absolutely critical to the tactical aspects of emergency response. And this has been well documented in empirical studies of human behavior in the sociology of disaster. The true first responders are often the immediate community members. Here you see a mix of formal responders and then community members helping to save this boy. Um, and this is particularly true in the case of structural collapse, where aid workers have a hard time getting in, right? Roads are obstructed. It's hard to get communications out. Those who are doing the rescues are those who are in the area because they know the lay, the lay of the land, literally. They know how to get around when there are roads that are otherwise blocked. They know who, who is in these buildings. They know, um, and they can, and of course, people have a better chance of surviving if they're rescued nearly immediately. This is true for as long as we have been able to document it. Um, I think the waterborne evacuation in the wake of 9-11 is very illustrative of this very point. Um, Kendra and Wachtendorf out of the University of Delaware explain this very nicely in a series of studies looking at the waterborne evacuation in 9-11. This is an image taken from the US Coast Guard. It's fuzzy because the air is pretty bad at this point in time. These are people who are converging in Battery Park. Um, and later, 
the waterborne evacuation begins, which is the spontaneous convergence of watercraft, boats of different sizes, um, fishing boats, tugboats, personal boats, to evacuate people off the island. And it's described as a very well-organized, self-organized event. There was no precedence for this. There was no plan for this. Um, and so this is this uh, analog that we see in the real world. And this calls back to the evacuation of Dunkirk in World War II um, in 1940, when uh, I think 340,000 soldiers Allied forces uh, were evacuated from the shores of Dunkirk. And it's called the miracle of Dunkirk because it's the same story. It was the merchant marines, fishing boats, pleasure craft, small boats, big vessels who were all evacuating these troops over less than the course of a week, which is remarkable. So we know, um, so how members of the public participate in disaster with digital support, that's new. Right? And that's what we're trying to study and design for intentionally in the future. But that they do it is not new. So one of the things I try to convey to audiences of emergency managers is that this isn't something we need to be afraid of. We need to understand the pitfalls and the potentials. But this was always happening. And so we just have to, we have to understand why people do this and how they do it, and then look at the opportunities as well as the concerns that this might have. So in terms of our work and what I would argue for in research in this area in the future, we look very broadly at the ecosystem of data that is moving around in emergency response. Um, we look at the, the internal ways in which people share information. We look at how emergency management seeks and, and provides information, and of course, how those activities are shared are, are influence each other. Very broadly speaking, we are interested in the mutually constructed information interface that, that is between those. So rather than seeing them as a kind of a cold, hard divide, uh, we are increasingly seeing this and sort of designing for an ideal future, not exactly sure how this will work, but where there's a more socially distributed uh, way of information, uh, managing information than certainly what we see today. OK, so. Um, uh, I'd like to characterize, so as Kate said, there were 20 to 21 million tweets or so that, that are meant to, um, that, that capture the Hurricane Sandy event. The growth has been exponential in terms of Twitter activity. So for example, in 2008, we were studying hurricanes Gustav and Ike. And those two hurricanes, which occurred close in time, generated about 100,000 tweets. And Haiti was about 4 million tweets. And sorry, Hurricane Sandy was about 20 million tweets, either two-year intervals. They're not perfectly comparable events, but it doesn't matter because the exponential growth is clearly there. Um, we've looked a lot at what is under the hood. What are people talking about? You know, there's a lot of stuff around um, expressing emotion and desires to help and donate and prayer activity, all of which actually is pretty sociologically interesting. We are interested in the situational awareness information that could be gleaned from the, um, from the disaster event. And in that way, I think there are two forms of public response we should be thinking about. There's the spontaneous public response, those, those um, reports of things that are happening on the ground, the I feel an earthquake, the, the photo of, 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 of devastation. Um, and we might want to think about how we can aggregate those together using machine learning techniques um, and human computation techniques to get a view excuse me, a view of, of those activities together. And then, of course, there's solicited response, which is basically the crowdsourcing angle on this. So what can we do to get information that we need um, from people on the ground? This is one tweet I'm going to use to capture both of these ideas. Um, this is a, it's a little bit dark, but the photo is actually naturally dark. Um, this is a photo taken in, uh, in Japan um, in the aftermath of the earthquake and tsunami. It's of a marketplace, and they're standing in line here. And this case, this refrigerated case, is all empty. And this is an example of the kind of spontaneous data that does arise in emergencies if you can find it. So here's a rough translation of the Japanese. So first we get some really good locational information. It says Fukushima City, Yukibeni Mall, Peace Temple Store waiting in the checkout line. So in absence of lat long information and precise information, we have a pretty good idea of where this is. Um, uh, there's no bread yet. As for daily items, we are without water, rice, plastic wrap. There used to be more than enough, an abundance of everything you could imagine from vegetables to fish to meat. 
Okay. So again, this kind of marketplace data is actually pretty valuable in emergency response. So though we, we sort of think of it as sort of outside the kinds of medical concerns that we might have and the rescue and the debris removal and all of this, this kind of information is also very useful. So this is an example of some spontaneous data that if we could find enough of it, we might be able to get some good ideas and then pursue other kinds of information. This is also a good design inspiration for the kinds of tasks we can give the crowd to do, or perhaps a selected part of the crowd to do. So market surveys, uh, micro market surveys, are really valuable in the um, aftermath of disaster for two reasons. One is that humanitarian aid workers are very interested in knowing what's available on the ground in terms of the supplies that they need to do the work that they're going to do. Um, but they also need to know if they um, can sustain themselves for two weeks or three weeks or whatever it is. So having a sense of what's happening on the ground and how that varies over a large area is very important. Later, in, uh, when we get into stages of recovery, the, the health of the marketplace with, with respect to price gouging and this kind of thing is very valuable for assessing community health. So this would actually be quite a nice place to do some crowd, uh, crowd work. And you can talk about a few others if there's time later. Self-organizing of digital help helper networks is also something that we see in response to all this data coming up. So people might see, um, I need a request, I need a request, I need antibiotics, and somebody else might be saying, be saying, I have antibiotics. And what we're seeing is that there are remote volunteers who are putting those requests together and saying, hey, you should talk to each other. This is a matchup, right? So they're doing all this human computation work. That's one example of some what then becomes some very elaborate self-organizing tasks very much like the waterborne evacuation, but in the digital world. There are also groups that see themselves as amateur, I don't know what the, I should call them amateur. They're, they're more than spontaneous volunteers. They have a, a desire to stay with this for the long term. Um, and Haiti was a very catalyzing event for many of these groups that were starting to uh, form in 2009. And then the Haiti earthquake hit in January, and we see some real new organization around them. And I have a video that describes in their own voices better than I can this sort of zeal they have about helping others. This is Geeks for Haiti. As a programmer, we can actually uh, help the people in Haiti. My name is Chad Cataccio, and I work with a group of volunteers. It's called Crisis Camp. We're really a community of disaster response and relief specialists. So we have firefighters here today, people from the UN working with us, from the Red Cross, and we've got people from Google, Yahoo. It's really a whole bunch of people who are really trying to build applications for this kind of situations. The reason why I came, and I imagine the reason why a lot of other people came, is because it's a, a surprise, a happy surprise, to think that as a hacker, as a coder, as a programmer, we can actually help the people in Haiti. Our stated goals are to build a new base layer map for Port-au-Prince. Another is to coordinate all of the missing persons directories and applications into one application. I'm on Twitter right now and I set up an account from the camp crisis and I'm finding other tweets about donations and how to help out and just resending all of that information. The reason I came down because I'm Haitian American and it's a story that's very personal. My grandmother's brothers, some of them are in Haiti right now. Staying home and watching CNN, I couldn't, I couldn't just do that for another day or just look at the internet or just give money. I felt like I need to volunteer and do something. You know, you send your money and, and that's it. You know, you feel like you can't get on the plane, you can't help people lift up the rubble. So we have a set of skills here uh, and we're just trying to apply them just like the urban rescue teams. They have a set of skills. They go, they can lift rocks and they can find people. We can code in Google Maps and, and try to provide them a better way to find those people. I don't know how to fix people, but I know how to fix computers. I know how to, to, to code. So um, if, I can, if I can help people like live by doing that, I mean, Oh, fantastic.
Okay, so this describes both the desires of the spontaneous volunteers, those who come in after dis disaster events and want to help for two weeks, a month at a time. But you also in here embedded are folks who then went on and formalized and sometimes even incorporated their groups and now respond disaster to disaster. So looking to them as an example for the kinds of work that can be done and how they're formalizing it is a very something very important to look at. Not just to advocate for volunteerism, in emergency response, which I do, but also to look at what these early volunteers are doing as a way to think about how to professionalize that work and how that will change the institution of emergency management in years to come. Probably the most successful example coming out of this effort, I mean, there were some things that were successful, some things that were not, um, uh, but one thing that was uh, sort of undeniably success successful is the work of the OpenStreetMap team. Um, this was, a, this is a snapshot a shot of Port-au-Prince before, the day before the earthquake. It was a virtually unmapped country, not just for OSM, but for other mapping agencies as well. This is what it looked like 21 days. If you can see the very fine resolution, if you can bore in, this whole thing is mapped. It was done by 600 volunteers in three weeks using donated aerial and uh, satellite imagery. And so it was, as ma it was mapped to within an inch of its life as best as it could by remote volunteers looking at you know, the, the sky eye view of what's going on. Um, and it became the de facto map for humanitarian aid response. So, you know, these are volunteers, people who are building sandbags to hold back the flood rivers of the 2009 Red River. What are the good uh, disaster-based crowdsourcing tasks um, that would be that would that we could design? This turns out to be a pretty hard question. Um, there are a, some good ideas, but there are many ideas for which we have to think about issues of liability. The usual way in which we think about liability is um, on the part of formal response. What problems do they assume? What liabilities do they assume? Thank you um, for uh, for taking in crowdsourced data. But there's also liability um, on the part of emergency of digital volunteers who are not protected by Good Samaritan laws. And if we as computer scientists are issuing tasks and we've had to think about how to design them really well, as well as platforms that will deliver those tasks, we are intentionally intervening and we are also not protected by those same things. So we have to think very hard about what those will be. We can talk about that perhaps in Q&A. So what's ahead? Crises are places of innovation. They always have been. We can think about this now literally in terms of computing innovation. So it's a wonderful thing to innovate for emergency management. I advocate for it strongly, but I'd also like to offer that emergency management itself is a place for innovation for computing. So we can learn a lot about computing by looking at situations of emergency management as a mass convergence event. We're going to see fundamental institutional shifts in practice and policy because of the things that are happening here, really big changes in the institution of emergency management. In addition to this, it's becoming very clear how much computer science can contribute to national and global interests and how immediate those concerns can be. So we get this shot from my lab of a group of public information officers who are doing some design work in our lab. And not very long later, there are cohorts uh, an hour down the road from us in Waldo, in the Waldo Canyon fires are working a real, uh, a real event. And so we are finding that um, our, we are perilously but excitingly close to a uh, real world application. So with all the computing research we do in natural language processing and human, com human computer interaction and CCW and software engineering, we discover that disaster after disaster, just how deeply consequential computer science research really is. Thank you. Thank you so much, Leisha. It's a pleasure to have you here. Next up, we have Eitan Adar, who is an assistant professor at the University of Michigan. I first met Eitan when he came to Microsoft Research as a visitor, and we happened to be working together at the exact time that the London riots occurred. So we actually started working with that data to see what we could learn about it. And I personally learned an enormous amount from Eitan, and he helps me uh, do data better. So please welcome him. Yeah.
Hello? Good. Perfect. OK. So hi. Thank you. Um, thanks for that great introduction. This will be a tough act to follow for <laughs> Thanks, Alicia. Um, as Kate mentioned, I'm sort of uh, studying at a broad level uh, the idea of using behavioral data um, at very large scales. So what can we take from uh, what people are doing on the internet and learning something interesting from that? So I'm going to try and talk today about how some of these ideas might apply uh, within the context of crisis informatics. So trying to leverage some of the ideas uh, from as early as the 60s on kind of non-reactive measurements um, to take into account what people are doing and learn something interesting from that. So this talk is broadly about measurement. Um, the first uh, set of things that we use to measure are um, kind of these very directed um, applications. So uh, surveys, questionnaires, interviews, and so on. What I want to talk to you today mostly is about the shift towards um, some of these indirect measures, these non-reactive or unobtrusive mechanisms of collecting data. And there's a huge shift in kind of the community of people that I work with um, where we're trying to take these extremely large data sets from Twitter, uh, from the news, uh, any kind of behavioral data sets that we can take and trying to learn something interesting about um, uh, some behavioral uh, attribute of that data. So what I mean by non-reactive uh, measures are basically, basically this, that we're measuring without asking people. We're not directly talking to them or asking them um, to contribute stuff. We're just sort of looking at um, the digital uh, deterioration that they're producing. So what are they creating as they live their lives um, and produce either on Twitter or uh, consume through the news and so on. Um, so the story of non-reactive measures is basically this, of accretion and erosion studies. Um, so measuring the kind of um, cow paths that people take take through their digital lives. And that allows us, through some sophistication, to tie that into something interesting about what we actually want to measure. So let me give you a specific example, which is, um, can you feel this earthquake? Okay. So um, in August of 2011, there was a big earthquake in Virginia. How many of you guys felt it? OK, a bunch. It was pretty sizable, uh, noticeable, although the actual um, scale was only 5.8. But it was kind of felt throughout um, the eastern seaboard. And the way the USGS, USGS traditionally measures um, whether this was felt um, is by asking. So you come to this website, and you answer this question, yes, I felt it, um, and sort of how much. And for this particular um, highly felt um, event, uh, 148,000 people responded. Okay? And this response was basically accumulated over many, many hours. Okay? So this is where there was a direct um, request by the USGS for information. Now compare this um, to data collected from Twitter. Okay? So what you're going to see is a big shock wave moving through the eastern seaboard and um, tweets basically capturing, I felt it. I just felt an earthquake and so on. Okay? So as the circle moves, you're seeing tweets. And just for a sense of scale, in the first five minutes um, after the earthquake, there were 90,000 tweets, a lot of them directly feeling um, the earthquake. And it's very interesting, because if you track sort of where um, these tweets were coming from, um, you'll see a very nice fit to the actual wave as it propagates um, through the eastern seaboard. Okay? And we'll come back to why this is good and this is and bad in a second. But let me just um, tie this back into the idea of non-reactivity and where um, sort of the tradition of non-reactivity comes from. Because this has existed since the 1960s, and people have learned sort of where it's good and where it's bad. And so the question is, can we apply some of those lessons um, from the social sciences um, in our analysis of these very large-scale um, pieces of data? So in three minutes. Um, there are lots of cute examples of what people do um, using non-reactive measures. So to figure out how scary a story is, people would watch a group of um, kids sitting in a circle come tighter and tighter into the circle. The scarier the story, the more they would tighten um, to, into the fire. Okay? Um, when you want to measure how popular a piece of art is, um, people have talked about looking at replacement of tiles on the floor. Okay? So people are just sort of making a path through the, um, through the museum, and as they're standing and watching a particularly popular piece of art, they're wearing down the floor. Um, if I'm a person who is uh, a, I'm selling cars um, and I want to figure out who to advertise to, uh, what this guy discovered in 1962 was looking at his customers and what their radios were tuned to when they came into the store. Okay? He would learn basically what channels they were listening to and then sell advertisement or buy advertisements on those channels. Non-reactive, right? Didn't ask them. He just looked at what um, the radio was set to. Okay? There's a huge tradition of figuring out what people are consuming in terms of alcohol, in terms of drugs, um, by studying people's trash. 
Okay? Um, there's a garbage project that's been going on since 1975, um, looking at um, how much trash people are producing, what kind, um, are poor people more likely to um, consume more or less. Um, people study um, citywide drug levels by looking at um, drug levels in the sewer system. Okay? Uh, again, non-reactive, we're not asking anything, we're just sort of measuring um, through these um, secondary means. To measure where the traffic is, um, people use cell phones. Okay, so as you move through um, your world, um, your cell phone is switching towers, and you can sort of measure um, how much traffic there is in a particular site by looking at this. Um, this is a kind of clever one. Someone wanted to know how Walmart was doing, uh, so they studied aerial photography of the of the store and looked at the um, number of cars in the parking lot. Okay. So these are all kind of cutesy examples of, of non-reactive measures. And the question is, where does it work and where does it not? And so you're probably thinking to yourself, OK, but um, you're starting to see the problems. Um, if you are reviewer two in the room, how many reviewer twos? Um, you're going to start asking me about bias. And of course, there's bias. It's a huge problem. Um, there's population bias in the things that we measure. Who is it that's actually using Twitter? Um, do they have phones? Is there power? Uh, People are reading the news. They're being biased by the news in weird ways. Um, there's incentives to produce and consume. Um, we see this in blogging networks a long time ago. This was a research project that I did um, looking at what bloggers were talking about and what um, more recently tweeters tweet about. Um, basically, they're trying to get some social capital by presenting new information to their community. And so um, there's a bias there. Right? Um, there's the benefit in being first, and the social signals are performed. It's not like throwing trash um, as you would into a regular trash can. It would be the equivalent of throwing trash into a uh, transparent trash can. Right? So there's a little bit of a performance art in the way you communicate with your public, and that has consequences for the way we utilize these non-reactive measures. Okay. There's a ton of noise in these things, and this is part of the, uh, the work that I'm doing now. And you see this kind of nice uh, trend that's fitting the line as, as the wave propagates um, through the, uh, as the earthquake wave propagates, but there's also a ton of this other stuff. Okay? And that other stuff represents part of the ecology of people communicating about a particular event. Okay? And the notion that I want to emphasize is that everything here is signal, but it's a question of what you're measuring. And so what we've started studying is um, a particular ecology around a specific event, in this case, um, the Japanese earthquake, tsunami, and kind of nuclear um, catastrophe in March of 2011. And what you look at um, when you see these kinds of um, pieces of information that are coming to you at a very large scale, um, you see people on the ground tweeting about the event itself. Um, so these lines in white are basically people tweeting about um, the actual event. They're experiencing it. You see their friends and family tweeting back. And you see people sort of having a meta conversation about this. There's a huge um, diverse set of people who are talking about this. Okay. You see government organizations producing data and pushing it into um, social media, and people are reacting to this. Um, this is an uh, uh, image of the tsunami as it, uh, simulated by the NOAA. Um, I do a little bit of visualization work. This is a kind of scary image. Um, so it looks much scarier than it actually is, but that gets a response. Um, you see the news doing what it's supposed to, and sort of the news' interaction with um, the way people are, are um, acting in social media is an interesting thing to study. Um, so this is news behaving properly. Um, you see people producing um, rumors, gossip. Um, this is a fake piece of information um, attributed to the Australian Radiation Services. This is completely fake. Um, but it was passed around by a lot of people, and even the news started picking this thing up. And so um, this is from Austria. Uh, this is from Australia. Um, sort of rebroadcasting this, this fake image. You see people reacting to the fake image, so the common public reacting. This is a um, sort of conspiracy theory website, but um, they're reacting to this, and they're telling you that um, to treat um, the impending doom of the, of the nuclear um, holocaust that's coming, uh, one should take shots of organic apple cider and potassium iodide. Okay? And we're going to see how this has an effect, actually, <coughs> on the prices of potassium iodide in a second. Okay. You see activists starting to work, so they're communicating through social media streams and sort of adding signal. Um, you see uh, people really behaving badly. So um, this is a, uh, you can't really read it, but um, it is a um, timeline of sort of people doing really bad things um, like um, spamming, um, adding SEO attacks, so search engine optimizer attacks, basically pushing millions of pages into search engine search engines using uh, Japan and tsunami as keywords. Um, and you see lots of fake donation scams going out through the public and people reacting to that. 
you see people behaving really well. Um, so this is um, tweets about Pray for Japan over kind of the time of the crisis. Um, stickers, uh, Lady Gaga. Um, anyone want to guess what this peak is? Justin Bieber. Okay. Um, Justin Bieber decided to pray for Japan that day. <coughs> anyway, it propagates. Okay. The point that I'm trying to make with this is that noise is rare. Okay. Um, Everything here is signal. It's just a question of whether it is measuring what it is that you want to be measuring. Okay? We are getting this tidal wave of data, and it's coming from this ecology. And lots and lots of signal, and it's great, but we sort of have to find ways of separating that out. Okay? So that's kind of the central problem that's been addressed um, extensively in the non-reactive literature how to make sense of lots and lots of signals that are coming at you at the same time. But to have this high level opinion that um, everything is signal, okay? even people who are scamming, if you're trying to measure how many scams are going on um, during a crisis situation, that's where the data is. Okay? So you have to treat everything as a signal. Okay. There's inevitably the question of ethics, and I'm sure we'll talk about this in a second. We laugh at people in these situations, but I'd like to point out that frequently these are people, these are sensitive populations, and even if they weren't sensitive before, they're being made sensitive by the crisis itself. And so as much as we joke about them, this is clearly a problem, and there's a problem um, then in terms of privacy. There's a problem in the bias we have um, in terms of response. So if we take these massive data sets and learn from them and then go out and act um, in the public, we're potentially biasing our response based on the population that we're studying. And so hopefully we can have more of a conversation about this at the end. Um, there might be an exacerbation of this through non-reactive measures. We're not sampling um, in a way that's you know, controlled in the sense that uh, we frequently like to think about it in, in um, the real sciences. But yeah, I'll, I'll reserve that judgment for later. We can talk about it. OK, so some, some solutions and a few more problems. Um, the non-reactive measurement community talks about multiples for everything. Okay? And I think this is a really great strategy um, that we should think about and apply extensively. So multiple indices, I'll give an explanation of that in a second. We should have multiple theories about what's going on. Um, we should have multiple hypotheses about what's going on. We should have multiple instruments. We should be measuring in lots and lots of different ways and bringing those results back and con constructing a, an idea of what's going on based on these, on these multiple instruments. Uh, Ramoni Cajal, uh, almost 100 years ago in his advice for young investigators, um, talks about the addiction to a specific instrument as a um, disease of the will. And I think that's kind of a nice way of thinking about it. Um, there's lots of ways of measuring things. And I think um, bringing them together is good. Okay? So we've been thinking about different ways of using specifically non-reactive measures, many non-reactive measures simultaneously um, to measure things. So one of the questions that we have in my group is how the public reacts in fear to certain kinds of event, events. And so you can do things like look for the word scared or scary. Um, in the Twitter stream, but you can be a little more sophisticated than that. There's other things aside from Twitter um, to study. And so we've been mining things like eBay and looking at the prices of um, potassium iodide. And what you can see is sort of the trend in price per milligram over time um, that's correlated with um, some specific events. So um, as uh, one core is starting to melt down, as stuff is being dumped into the ocean and so on, we're seeing these reactions. And all these signals together are telling us something interesting. Um, Another thing we're studying is sort of the, the press's contribution to the fear <coughs> of, of comparison kind of thing. So um, you are, you're about to die um, kind of stuff. Um, and the other thing that I want to bring up is, again, that the multiple instruments, I think, is, is key here. So um, yes, we can do this, and that's great. But there's something to be said about actually asking people what it is that they're experiencing. Okay? So this is what the website looks like on the USGS. Uh, lots and lots of questions, but we're getting lots and lots of information. Having those two things simultaneously helps us triangulate what's going on. So this is my wish list um, um, to support multiples, uh, multiple acquisition systems, getting lots of data, um, multiple and better models. This is a huge problem. Um, the predictive community doesn't understand the explanatory community. The explanatory community doesn't understand um, the predictive community. And I think there's a little bit of an effort that needs to be um, paid there um, to make that work. Um, knowledge mining systems, I think, can be improved. And multiple integrated instruments, I think, can help. So to summarize, I think non-reactive measures are great. I think there's huge limitations. I think we can learn from the history of non-reactive instruments and sort of do better um, and uh, apply them to the scale and scope of the problem that we experience today. OK, and with that, thank you.
Thanks so much, Eitan. I'll just uh, fill a little time talking to you about how amazing our final speaker is today. This is Andres Monroy Hernandez, who's based here at Microsoft Research in Redmond. He has been doing a lot of work looking at social media and crisis events. Uh, prior to that, though, you might also know him as the person who invented the Scratch online community for kids when he was based at MIT. Uh, now, Andres is doing work that I think is really important, thinking about the politics of visibility. What happens when we make particular kinds of communities visible through data, and how do we need to think about that differently during a crisis event? Thank you, Andres. switch. You set? Yeah. Uh, thanks a lot, Kate. Uh, hi, my name is Andres Monroy Hernandez, and I'm going to talk to you about uh, issues of visibility with social media data during disasters. Uh, so Kate asked us to think about challenges and opportunities of big data and social media uh, in the context of disasters. So I thought about telling you about three different um, case studies of collective action, what I call hashtag collective action, related to disasters. The first one uh, comes from Mexico, where there's a drug war, a war against the drug cartels going on, and where social media is playing a very important uh, role. Uh, the second one is a social movement uh, that emerged last year during the presidential election, also in Mexico, as a result of what people perceive as, um, you know, um, some bias of the media. And the third one is more recent, just as, you know, a few weeks ago, as you've probably seen on the news. Uh, in Brazil, there's been a lot of protests against the government, and we started to analyze some of these in the, in the context of how do we think about, you know, a crisis or acute events in this, in this world. Um, so first, with the narco tweets uh, example that I was mentioning. Uh, so here, the issue about visibility actually plays a really interesting role, because both visibility and opacity empower and disempower citizens in this case. Uh, so just to give you some context, um, you know, the Mexican drug war is an actual war. It's not just like this you know, metaphorical way of referring to, to the, drug, uh, the, the war against drugs. Uh, so there is a crisis happening every day as part of everyday life in many cities. And there's more than 60,000 people who have died since the war started in uh, 2006. Um, but typically, you know, when we think about emergency response, just like Leisha was saying, uh, you have you know, the, the government officials who are kind of the, 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 origin, the official source of information uh, about these events. And, uh, you have the media that is you know, typically helping broadcast these messages. Uh, unfortunately, in the case of Mexico, these two institutions are not working. Both the government and the media are being quiet about what's going on. And here I'm just going to quote from uh, the, Wall Street, uh, the Washington Post, uh, an article that describes this very, very example. So here it says, you know, fearing for their lives and the safety of their families, journalists are adhering to a near complete news blackout under strict orders of drug smuggling organizations and their enforcers who dictate via daily telephone calls, emails, and news releases what can and cannot be printed or, or aired. So again, the, the drug cartels are dictating to the media what can and cannot be printed. Um, and this obviously creates a lot of concern among journalists, many of whom have been killed. Uh, similarly, this, this kind of censorship extends to the government. So here again, the same article says, you know, the news blackouts extends to the government officials in one example, the city of Nuevo Laredo, which is in the border with Texas, um, the mayor mysteriously disappears for days and refuses to discuss drug violence. The military general who presides uh, over the, the soldiers patrolling the city does not hold news conferences, issue statements, or answer questions from the media. So you have, if you're a citizen in this place, you know, you see a shooting, grenade attacks, you know, car bombs, and then you turn on the TV and all you see is soap operas or, you know, all sorts of, you know, mainstream uh, media that, you know, that is being censored. Um, one of the interesting things about this, the, the, the drug one in Mexico is that this is coupled by, you know, the general um, pervasiveness of social media. So in the past few years, you know, just like many other countries, especially in the developing world where people are getting access through technology, um, to technology through, um, you know, mobile phones, you see an increased adoption of social media. So this coupled with these weakened institutions like the media, the government, and uh, the increase of violence created the following. So when we started looking at this issue, one of the things that was really interesting to me is, you know, looking at Twitter, for example, uh, tweets like this one, and I'm going to translate this to Spanish. Uh, so here it says, you know, a person named Angela. Obviously, I changed the name, but the, the, the quote is still the same. Uh, quote, uh, it says, caution on Gonzalez Avenue by the big supermarket. People report a recent risky situation. 
uh, and then hashtag MTY follow. So risky situation is a euphemism that people use on, on Twitter in particular in Mexico to refer to all sorts of violent events, from grenade attacks to shootings to car bombs. Uh, and people, you see, if you go right now on Twitter, actually, if you go to MTY follow, uh, you will see a lot of tweets like these ones reporting what's going on in the city in re with regards to the, to the drug war. Uh, the MTY follow is, uh, MTY is the initials of the city of Monterey in Mexico. Uh, is the airport code, and follow is like an invitation to, to follow this. So if you really know, if you really want to know what's happening in the city, your best bet is to go to Twitter and check what's going on there. Um, so what we did is, you know, just look at a bunch of different tweets uh, with different hashtags for different cities, and what you see, you know, just kind of a typical word cloud uh, first pass analysis that we did, you know, you see words like balacera uh, being one of the most prominent ones, which is shooting in Spanish. You also see things like percussion, you see the tonaciones, which is blast, and you see also you know, the names of some, some, some Twitter users, as well as locations in the city um, that, that refer to where things are happening. We wanted to be more detailed, and what we did is we looked at uh, four different cities in Mexico, uh, from north to south, Reynosa, which is one of the cities uh, in the border with Texas, all the way to Veracruz at the bottom, which is a city in the Gulf of Mexico that is also being affected by the drug war. And one of the things that we noticed is that the spread of you know, uh, amount of uh, volume of tweets you know, also represents the way the violence has spread from north to south in the country. The other thing you notice is there are a bunch of spikes, and these spikes actually correspond to major events uh, in, in, in these cities. So for example, the, the spike in Monterey, the second city over there, uh, it corresponds to an event where 52 people were killed in a casino by the drug cartels. So you see, like, more or less, the, the, the kind of volume of tweets uh, represents what's going on in the streets. One of the things that we wanted to know, you know, who are these people tweeting? You know, as kind of like what Lesha was saying is that there are tons of different people who can, be tweeting, who can be tweeting from emergency organizations to just regular informal uh, people who are, you know, talking about what's going on. And so we decided to plot just very simply uh, the tweets in, a, in each one of the cities, and this is, represents similar patterns in all the cities that we looked at. Uh, basically, on the x-axis, you see the number of tweets that they contribute to this conversation. Uh, on the y-axis, you see the number of followers that people have to kind of trying to measure the amount of impact or, or influence that these people might have. And what we notice is like these kind of three categories, broadly speaking. The first one is, you know, people like CNN in Espanol, organizations like that, that actually are using the hashtags that the, the citizens themselves came up with, uh, like MTY follow, the one I showed before. But they tweet very little with that hashtag because they obviously are reporting on what's going on all over the world uh, just in Spanish. Uh, but they do tweet sometimes. So you see these people have like uh, millions of followers, but they have tweeted only a couple of times with that hashtag. Then you have you know, people like average citizens who happen to be at the wrong time at the wrong place, and they kind of tweet what happened and what they've seen. And then you see what we call the curators. These are people with lots of followers, not as many as CNN, obviously, but lots of them, hundreds of thousands in some cases and who have contributed a lot of content to the community that discuss what's going on in the city. And these are people who have taken the responsibility of you know, checking on Twitter, connecting with people, even calling on the phone, and kind of broadcasting a message of what's going on on the streets. Uh, so you know, if you look at a network of retweets, you'll see the same group of people also emerging as kind of highly influential. So we decided to actually talk to them and reach out to them. Obviously, it's very difficult because, as you may imagine, these are you know, it's a very difficult job that they do. But we talked to a, a bunch of them, and this is just some quotes from some of them. Uh, Angela, on the one side, she, was, she has about 25,000 followers. Uh, Claudia here has about 30,000 followers. Uh, and you see the number of tweets that they produce, you know, 35,000 tweets over the course of only a few months in the case of Angela, 60,000 tweets in the case of Claudia. Uh, and the number of hours per day, I asked them, you know, how much time do you spend on Twitter doing this job? Uh, Angela said that she spends about 15 hours a day. I don't know exactly what she does for a living, but my impression is that she has a job that allows her to be, you know, on her phone on the side. But it was quite impressive to me, you know, the amount of time that these people spend uh, on Twitter. Uh, I asked them, you know, just one of the many questions is, how do you see your role uh, on, on these communities? And in the case of Angela, she says, you know, I'm a journalist. It is as if I was a war correspondent on social networks of the world we are living in Mexico. And actually, this is the title of one of our papers, because I thought it was really interesting to see how they see themselves as journalists uh, rather than just average citizens. Um, but then we have uh, people like Claudia who says, you know, my role on Twitter is that of yet another citizen, but uh, people tell me that I'm like their angel for looking after them. So a lot of people before they leave home or before they leave work, a lot of my friends actually who live in the city, they tweet at them and say, you know, is this city safe or not? or they just simply check what, what uh, areas of the city are, are safe to, to navigate. Um, so they, they really play an important role. 
Uh, so one of the challenges here from you know, the point of view of social uh, media data is you know, the visibility that these people might have. On the one hand, you know, it empowers them to help others. But on the other hand, you can imagine, as in the case of these two uh, social media users, um, you know, it can really put them in danger. So they're trying to navigate and decide how to best use these technologies in a way that doesn't put them in danger. So one of the, 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 the kind of uh, practices that people have decided to, to, to approach social media with is uh, you can report on public information. So a shooting outside in the street is public information for which the cartels are typically not interested in, in going after you. But if you report private information, like you know, the hidden location of a particular person or safety houses and things like that, that actually leads to issues like this one. Uh, people also have to be worried about the government. Like this is the case of two Twitter users in the state of Veracruz who were sent to jail on charges of terrorism for spreading misinformation on social media about the war that was going on. At the end of the day, we didn't know exactly if it was true or not what they were tweeting, but definitely the government believed that they were spreading fear and they charged them with terrorism. They were sent to jail for a month after uh, you know, Amnesty International and other organizations helped them to get out. But it really you know, created a, a, a lot of challenges for people who are reporting the news. Um, the second case that I want to talk about is a movement that happened in Mexico last year. We had a presidential election, and one of the questions that often came up during uh, when I discussed this job is this, this type of work. Uh, people ask, you know, how, what can people do to go beyond just reporting what they see on the streets? Are people, you know, organizing politically? And this actually happened last year. Uh, so just to put the context of it, this is the, the, the movement. Uh, it was a movement as a response to uh, this particular candidate, a uh, candidate for president. And people were really upset about his track record on human rights. And once uh, he went to a to university, I'm just going to go quick. He went to a university. He gave a speech, just like you know, they do every day. And students started to protest there and recorded it with their cameras and uploaded videos to YouTube of the protest. But it was a you know, somewhat small protest at a university. Uh, however, what happened the next day was really interesting. The mainstream media reported uh, that his presence at the university has been quite successful, despite attempts to boycott him uh, by some you know, um, opponent. Uh, so the students were really upset that they were being portrayed as trying to boycott and being paid by one of the opponents. So they released this video that went viral uh, one of the days, uh, a few days after the, this event. And the students were holding their ID saying, you know, I'm a student and we are 131 students and, you know, here is my ID to prove you that I'm not being paid by the, by the opposition. Uh, so this video went viral and, and you know, later, uh, a few days later, the movement started to spread and the, the movement was called I Am 132, kind of as a response to the 131 students on the video. And one of the things that we did, we, know, you, we wanted to see who was reacting to this uh, movement in the sense that they were tweeting with the hashtag I Am 132. And one of the fascinating things is that both people on the left and people on the right were kind of responding to the call for action by the student movement. Uh, so it was not just the students anymore, it was kind of growing and growing. And even the kind of Twitterati, the people who were really active on social media in Mexico, started to engage in this discussion. Uh, one of the also really interesting things is that in Mexico, as, you know, in the US as well, there is a, a strong class division. And one of the fascinating uh, phenomena that we observe is that people from different universities, these are all the names of the universities, started to tweet it in, in, in support of the students of the first university, which is a very rich and wealthy university that typically is not associated with political uh, um, you know, protest. Uh, so at the end, you know, people are going to the streets, you know, people claiming that you know, the, the, the media was biased and that the, the democracy is not a soap opera. Uh, people also calling others to join the, the protest and even making references of social media and the protest themselves. Um, and then also claiming that now we are the ones in charge of giving the news, no, no longer these t two TV networks. Uh, the movement exploded when all over the country and even outside the country from Chicago to China and even uh, Julian Assange kind of joined the movement as well. Uh, one of the really interesting about things about the movement is that they were able to galvanize interest across multiple sides of the political spectrum and even organize uh, the, the third presidential debate, just like completely organic, uh, all students. And, uh, and obviously that candidate that they were against, to, uh, the, the, he didn't decide to participate, but the other ones did and they had a like, live Google Hangout and broadcast on YouTube of the presidential debate. Um, and they, they even had like, a group of people who were fighting against bots to reduce the number of tweets that were uh, in favor of the, of the presidential candidate. 
Unfortunately, uh, or fortunately for, for uh, other people, um, the movement itself didn't end up making a big uh, you know, impact in, in the outcome of the, the, of the election. And Peña, the candidate that, that they were against, uh, he ended up winning the election. And one of the reasons why is because you know, the politics beyond social media were actually more important for this election. There is a, a lot of people who are not on social media who you know, couldn't express their voice and whose voice was not really part of the discussion on social media. So these people you know, were not heard. And, and people kind of had a biased version of what was going on in, in, the, in the politics because they were paying attention to, to, tradition, to social media. Instead of, you know, this is an image of uh, the gifts that the candidate from uh, Peña Nieto from the PRI gave, gave to uh, indigenous people in remote areas of Mexico who, whose vote is as valuable as the vote of those who are on Twitter. Um, so I don't have as much time to talk about some of the work that we have done recently on Brazil. But one of the interesting things, I'm just going to go quickly here, is that one of the things we notice is their connection to the Turkish uprising that is going on at the same time. And what we looked at, you know, again, using uh, Twitter data, is the mentions of the hashtags related to the Brazilian movement and the ones uh, in the Istanbul. And we saw a kind of the Istanbul people kind of referring to the hashtags of Brazil as a way to kind of connect the two movements. Uh, and the last thing I want to show is this uh, plot where we show kind of how the protest changed over time and how these are the, the interactions among the top 1% of protesters on Twitter uh, for the Brazilian movement and how it kind of started very sparse. It grew a lot by June 19, 17, and it kind of went back to the same uh, group of people and more sparse uh, connections among them uh, on social media. So again, some of the, 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 cha the challenges, uh, challenges and opportunities that social media gives us to understand what's going on in the movement are anything from visibility on the drug cartels and opacity that you know, empowers some citizens uh, all the way to you know, the visibility that might allow uh, different social movements to connect with one another across you know, uh, international barriers. Uh, with that, thank you. Thanks so much, Andres. Well, we have a little time left now for questions, so uh, we'll have all of the speakers up on stage. And Fernando is going to take a mic if you'd just like to raise your hand. And we would love to hear your thoughts and ways in which these issues might be coming up in your work. Please come have a seat. Hi, I'm Doug Ord from the University of Maryland. Great set of presentations. Um, I don't work on the social media side of this. I, I work on information retrieval, a little bit of natural language processing. And when I look at work that's getting started like this, we always do simple things at the beginning. We plot how many times this word's being used. We plot uh, what the level of activity is. Uh, we look at the social network. And I have this feeling that 20 years from now, that's not the way we'll look at the problem, that, that we'll have much more sophisticated ways of asking questions. And so do you have anything to offer to us of, of sort of a wish list of things that we might be able to take from what we know how to do, for example, in processing news and be able to bring it into this world? Fantastic question. Lacey, do you want to kick us off? Um, I'm not sure if I do. Uh, Jump in the deep end. Um, yeah, no, I think, so, so let me say that I think all the ways that we're trying to tackle this problem now are, are things I support. Um, I do find, if I could just answer the question from a slightly different angle, um, I do, I'm excited by all the new research that's happening in this area. I've been waiting some years for it. Um, I do want to make sure that those who are working in this space and bringing their respective techniques to it really do understand the domain of emergency management or mass disruption or whatever it is that they're studying very, very well. Because there's a lot of cute and clever things that we can do, but do they map to the things that we really care about? Um, and those, I think, give rise to new methodological approaches or at least variations on what we normally, what, we, what we've done in the past to address those kinds of problems. So I think that commitment to the domain will, will naturally change the kinds of questions and the ways in which people study those. So in our work, for example, we combine um, behavioral research, kind of you know, both quantitative and then qualitative, almost ethnographic investigations of these large qualitative data sets um, to then think about, well, what would that mean for building classifiers to get at that thing that turned out to be pretty interesting? So like we didn't know about the digital volunteer networks until we were 
you know, deep in the data and then realize, well, these people seem to know each other. What? Are they? Oh, wow, look at them. Um, and they, because they didn't advertise themselves in any other way. So. If I can add something to that, I feel like one of the, can I use this one? Yeah. One of the interesting things and most frustrating things about doing work on this space is the fact that most of the analysis always happens afterwards. And afterwards, you can see, you can see and analyze things uh, very easily. Uh, but I haven't seen as much work on like real time reaction to these events. And the most sophisticated things that we have right now for the mass uh, audience is things like trending topics on Twitter, right? Something's trending on Twitter may be worth paying attention, especially if it's related to an emergency or something like that. But I haven't seen as much work uh, in the, outside the research on things that try to aggregate and help people in real time as their practices change. Because a lot of it, a lot of the technologies for emergency that I've seen are things like an app that you can download when an emergency is happening. But the reality is that you're not gonna download an app you know, when something bad is happening. You, ha you are using the tools that you're already accustomed to. Uh, so I think that was, to me, one of the most interesting challenges for CS. I guess I'd just like to add that I think there is a trend right now um, towards having more sophisticated techniques. There were a bunch of low-hanging fruits that were available to us, and that's sort of what a lot of people ended up doing. But um, people are applying really sophisticated named entity extraction to the news articles that's, that are being cited by um, the people on Twitter. And so you can sort of do lots of cross-linking and deeper analysis of, of what's being produced and consumed. Um, I think there's huge research challenges in the way people are communicating around um, crisis events or anything on Twitter, actually, if, if you want a broader problem. Um, the language is messy, shallow, I don't know what you want to call it, but um, it's hard to um, have an uh, apply kind of standard algorithms to it, and I think there's a huge opportunity there. So um, we're seeing some people, I mean, there's, there's a bunch of work at like CMU, at UW, of people trying to kind of more deeply understand what's actually being spoken uh, in instances like Twitter and, and other places where there's really sparse information. But um, I think that's you know something that we can keep working on and making better. Um, and I think also, Honestly, a lot of the people working in crisis informatics, so I um, was one of the people who started ICWSM, the Web Logs and Social Media Conference, and I see a lot of the papers that come in, and there's sort of a separation between um, the people who are building the tools and the people who want to use them. Um, and there's a huge disconnect, and the people who want to just use them use these sophisticated tools frequently aren't um, being given tools that are actually useful. And I think that needs to change a little bit. So as we're manufacturing new um, analysis techniques and code um, to make that available to people who are not necessarily interested in directly contributing to um, the latest and greatest part of speech tagger, but actually want to use it um, in, their own, in their own lives. And I'd just like to add to Eitan's point, I think that's an excellent perspective. We tend to think about these issues from a scientist's perspective, just top down. What can we extract from this data? How can we understand what's happening on the ground better? I think you know, what I hope we'll see in the next few years are ways in which communities can actually use these tools themselves to address issues that are important to them, rather than necessarily this top down view where we tell them how they can use resources more effectively. I think that's something I would like to see. And I know there are several people in this room who are working towards particular kinds of programs and tools that I hope can make that happen. Do we have another question? Yeah, just here. Uh, Ed Cutrell and at MSR in India. And this was fabulous, but it was really, really heavy on Twitter. And so I'm, I, you know, I mean, there was a touch about, you know, multiple sources that we talked about. There's ethnographic stuff. There's this notion at the very end of Andre's talk about the fact that, oh, we kind of missed this giant group of tribals and other folks that actually made all the difference. And I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about this vast amount of stuff that's not Twitterati, mm. um, that's actually really important signals. And how do we start to get at that? And what do you think where that's going? Great question. You don't have to worry about it too much longer because Twitter is shutting down access to researchers. <laughs> um, so it, it's it's been easy to get that data, I think, for a lot of us and a lot of the community at large. But there's um, activity within Twitter to shut down access, and I think um, people are building more sophisticated ways of um, acquiring data. Part of it is that um, it's easy to turn on a knob, a faucet, basically, and just keep track of what's coming in from Twitter. Um, but when you're reacting to specific events, you have to go and turn on all these different places, all these different data sources that are really custom. So for example, to measure the price of potassium iodide on eBay, I had to write special scripts and, and do all this stuff. I had no kind of off-the-shelf stuff, and so there's a big delay and how long it took before I could actually start capturing that information. And so that's a huge, a huge concern for us. And I think tools will get better. But um, for a little while, you're going to see more Twitter, I think. Less Twitter. 
Well, so, uh, okay. so methodologically, it's been very helpful to begin with Twitter as the immediate data set that you collect, that one collects in quick response research, because you can turn it on, right? And so, um, but what we do is we think of it as not just the object of study, but it as a navigational space. So if there's some other online resource or activity that others are using, then the thinking is that it will appear at least once in some Twitter message. And so then if we can traverse those links, then we start getting an idea of the universe of the interaction. So it's very hard to know when one is collecting data during events like this, are you collecting something selectively and do you know that? And can your research question stand up because through selective sampling or do you need to know about something representative? So in terms of representativeness, Twitter is a good place to begin for that and then we move on. And we look at many other kinds of online resources as well. Yeah, just to mention one uh, type of work that I've seen that goes beyond Twitter is uh, uh, last week at ICWSM, um, David Lasser and his group were showing how they were install they are installing apps on people's phones that allows them to then go back in history and see what phone calls they've made after, for example, the Boston bombing and things like that to validate the results that they might see on Twitter. And obviously there's a huge growth now in sensors as well and we're seeing an enormous amount of city data being generated by sensor networks. So I think certainly in the next couple of years we'll be seeing a lot more of that as well. But great question. Do we have uh, probably time for a couple more? Yeah. Hi, uh, Hao Chi from Northwestern University. Um, so really great talks, thanks. Um, so my question is about going beyond information and data. So it seems like there's been really great work on thinking about both how to use the crowd uh, to get information from them on what's happening on the ground, but also to use them as aggregators and curators uh, in that process so that information can better be shared and then for people to build tools on top of that for the information to be even better communicated, uh, both to public officials who are trying to actually deal uh, with the disaster or the crisis situation, but also to the community so people know what's going on. Um, and my question is, can we go beyond that? Um, is there a role for the crowd to actually, uh, so people in the community to actually maybe participate in disaster relief to form uh, individual or collective action plans and be able to have a sense of resources that others have and also the resources that they have uh, being shared and being able to somehow put that together in a way where they have their local view and also a global view of what's going on uh, in the course of the disaster. So I just would love to get your thoughts on that. Fantastic. Uh, well, one thing that I always thought about about uh, crowdsourcing and the kind of crisis that I've been describing is typically one of the challenges of crowdsourcing that I see is that the people doing the work, like Turkers, and the people needing the work are kind of totally separate from one another, and the Turkers probably don't care at all about some of the, the tasks that they're being asked to. But in the case of some of the, the, the crises that I've been looking at, that, this, that separation might actually be an asset. So the fact that you are living, you know, 10,000 miles away from the, the person reporting the problems might actually help you in terms of privacy and some of the challenges with, say, the drug cartels going after you. Um, so I feel like there might be ways, I don't, exactly, I don't exactly know what, but there might be ways of leveraging that distance uh, between those crowdsource workers and the, the, the people having the, the problems uh, that might actually be used uh, as, a, as a positive feature of these systems. And then if I can just answer quickly, that's a really great set of questions and thinking and um, I, think that is, I think that is where we need to go. Um, just to look at some real world examples that we can draw from now, um, the World Bank has done some really great stuff in cooperation with the OpenStreetMap community to localize mapping efforts in developing regions to make those regions more resilient and develop a kind of capacity and self-knowledge about their geographies and resources so that they can then hazard a hazard um, much better um, in the future. So you're starting to see these kinds of things that are happening in serious ways, but there, there's so much opportunity as you rightly point out. And if I can just give you an example of a little case study that I think is really fascinating. Do you know about SafeCast in Japan? So after Fukushima, um, when a lot of Japanese residents were concerned about the radiation levels, they found that the Japanese government wasn't giving them enough data around you know, what was happening and what, what were the various radiation levels around the country. And so Sean Bonner uh, was having a discussion with Joe Ito, who's based at the Media Lab, and they said, what about if we actually try to get radiation detectors, Geiger counters to people in Japan, and then they can use this to let us know how the radiation levels are shifting depending on where they are, because there are radical differences depending on what side of the street you're on. But they found, of course, that what happened is that all the Geiger counters had been sold out, because this is what happens after a major nuclear problem. Uh, so what they decided is they would design a really basic DIY kit 
that would act as a Geiger counter, release the plans, actually get a whole lot of really basic, you know, almost pre-made kits to people in Japan. And they formed this extraordinary network. And if you look up Safecast, you'll see just how much data they gathered. So I think these kinds of interventions that can often happen, obviously, within institutions like the World Bank that Leisha has pointed out, but I think also outside of institutions, people are finding ways to organize and do really extraordinary things with community-based data. Time for one last quick question, if someone has one just here. Yeah, hi, uh, I'm Kayur. Um, great presentation. So my question is somewhat similar to what uh, uh, Ed asks. Uh, so this reminds me of two uh, major events which happened in India a few years back. So first one was Jessica Lal uh, murder case, which happened a few years back. And the recent one in 2012 uh, was the corruption movement in, uh, against the government. Uh, so first question is with respect to, uh, do you, uh, so, so just to give a background, Jessica Lal uh, murder case, uh, the messages were very prompt and messages were used to inform other people uh, to come for the uh, protest. And in the second, um, the Facebook and other media and uh, majorly um, a yoga guru um, uh, called Baba Ramdev, he had played a huge role in the protest getting people over there. So my question is first, uh, do you really uh, look at the paradigm shift from what kind of technologies or what social media has changed over the years? That's first. Second thing is, uh, do you really look at these data uh, apart from social media? For example, the way I said about uh, a yoga guru uh, having a huge impact on the uh, protest. And if yes, you do see, see that uh, aspect of it, do you see any kind of co-relationship between these political uh, issues and the social media? And you know, yeah, that's, that's majorly my question. It's a huge question, so perhaps we can just have a quick response from each of our panelists and then we'll wrap. I have wrap. no idea. <laughs> Sorry. So is the, is the question, um, what does the online, online activity do in relation to the physical world activity of protests? Is that kind of the summary of the question? Yes. So do you find any kind of co-relationship between both of them? Yeah, so there's been some good writing on this in um, the CMC world that has really tried to tie it more closely. Um, I don't know if I can speak to that off the cuff, but we can certainly talk about that offline. Um, we've done a little bit of work looking at um, the online sphere, so really failing to connect it to the real world because we knew we couldn't. This is work I did with Kate Starbird because we weren't on the ground and doing the work. It's, you know, that's a very difficult thing to do. But we did look at how ideas get diffused in the rest of the world around something that's happening on the ground. To the extent that the knowledge of the awareness of the rest of the world happening, uh, being aware of those things that are happening on the ground supports them in some way or expresses some kind of solidarity, I think there is a kind of solidarity, but I don't know what it does in terms of galvanizing action. There is actually a really good paper by Zeynep Tufaki on the impact of Facebook and Twitter in the willing to participate in some of the protests in Egypt that actually gets at exactly that issue. Yeah. So if you would all just join me in thanking our speakers today, we've run out of time. Thanks so much. Thank you.